Don't jump into a partnership with someone that you met like 15 minutes ago. Like, you know, I'm sure you're a great guy, Jerome, but like, if you want to partner with me, we need to get to know each other a little bit first, right? Like we can't, I mean, we met on LinkedIn last week or something. So as an operator, I know other investors are romanticizing multifamily investing, and I'm looking to learn from other investors' mistakes. I know you are too, and you found the right place. Welcome to Myers Methods Presents Multifamily Missteps. Hey, everybody, and welcome to Myers Methods Presents Multifamily Missteps. I'm your host, Jerome, and I've got the pleasure of having Jeffrey with me today. Jeffrey, how are you? Uh, I, I'm good. I'm really good, actually. Uh, so how you been, Jerome? Doing well? Yeah, man, I'm great. Just excited to be able to chat with you a little bit. I met Jeffrey on LinkedIn, believe it or not, and uh, he's got a really, really interesting story. Uh, I don't want to steal the thunder. Will you tell the listeners a little bit about yourself and how you got into the space? Uh, sure. So, you know, I'm, I'm a lawyer by background, so I, I did bankruptcy work for the first uh, five or six years of my professional career. I did that. And uh, uh, around 2008, I was diagnosed with leukemia. So I ended up, uh, you know, not able to work and I was working for myself. So it ended up spiraling out of control really fast and I became... Um, a statistic in my own field, right? A bankruptcy attorney who ended up filing bankruptcy in 2010. Um, and, you know, it was, uh, it was a tough time, there's no doubt. But uh, at that point, I had a choice to make and I decided I wanted to uh, make sure that if I did die, because I still wasn't sure what was going to happen with the leukemia, that there was some residual income for my wife. So I decided I needed to start investing in real estate. Uh, and it's worked out pretty well. That was, you know, it's 10 years ago now, and uh, it's all I do anymore. I haven't practiced law in the last uh, well, about seven or eight years, and I, uh, I haven't done any kind of regular work other than real estate in, in three or four years now. So That's amazing, and I'm glad you're so It seems like you're contributing in a big way to the community. Uh, you, how could, if people want to get in touch with you after they hear your story, what's the best way for them to do that? I know you got to talk um, yeah, so I mean, if they just want to know more about me, it's just jeffreyholst.com. Uh, it's uh, J-E-F-F-R-E-Y-H-O-L-S-T.com. Uh, and then uh, otherwise, if you want to see my show, I have a real estate show where we get drunk and talk about real estate. It's called the Old Fashioned Real Estate Show. We drink bourbon old fashions uh, and just talk about real estate. Short, you know, it's like the length of one drink. So basically people sit down with a drink. Uh, watch, you don't have to drink, but it's more fun if you do, right? And you sit down, have a drink, uh, watch an episode. And if you watch two or three episodes, then you're no longer coherent and you have to wait till next week to watch the rest. But <laughs> That's awesome. I've checked out a couple of shows. It's really entertaining. And you can tell the effect is happening as you get deeper into the episode. So it's really yeah. Yeah, well, in you know, sometimes we film two or three episodes the same day, so you can kind of tell which ones we uh, filmed which days. Uh, you know, if we filmed three in a day, the third one's usually a little silly. But, but, uh, but listen, we pick a content uh, topic each week, and uh, or, you know, and just try to like drill down on one topic. So, like one week, it might just be cap rates, right? Like, how, how do you understand them? What do they mean? Next time, it might be you know market cycles or something. So we're just trying to give back. It's it's not actually anything we make money on. If anything, we lose money on it because we, you know, we spend money for camera people and editing and stuff like that. And uh, we don't get any money back, but, but uh, you know, it's been good and it's been a lot of fun. Plus since I started doing that show, I get invited on other people's shows all the time, which is fun. So that's how we ended up here. It could that's be a lot worse. That's awesome. So I suspect you have a misstep that you're willing to share with the listeners today. Uh, yeah, I mean, everyone who does real estate long enough is going to have something that goes wrong. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, I mean, I, I thought about this a little bit before we came on the air and I was like, man, you know, actually in my multifamily world, um, I haven't had too bad of problems, um, but I've been very lucky, right? So I want to start out by premising that and then I'll tell you what I'm thinking misstep wise. So the um, last few years, multifamily has been really good. Now, obviously, with the coronavirus, it might change here a little bit. We'll see what happens. But, uh, you know, if you overpaid for a piece of multifamily real estate in a small apartment complex uh, four years ago, it doesn't really matter, right? Like, you made a ton of money anyway, unless you're 
paying way too much, which the banks don't even let you do that, right? So you'd have to buy it for cash or something to pay that kind of money. So, and we did, I mean, our first uh, deal that we did was this little 12 unit. It's about, I don't know, 20 miles from where I live now. Uh, and uh, we, we probably overpaid 10 or 15%, but now it's worth so much more than what we paid. It doesn't, it doesn't really matter, you know? So, uh, and that's a learning curve. Um, you know, the biggest mistake I think that I made though, um, really came with, well, uh, let me step back one more time. I apologize for that, for all your listeners. There's another mistake I made that's not really multifamily uh, specific. It's I didn't get started soon enough, right? I started buying the single family houses like right away when I filed bankruptcy. As soon as I could have any money, I started doing that. And uh, that was a trick anyway with no credit and no money, but we figured it out. But I've been researching real estate for a decade before that. If I had done it sooner, I would have never ended up bankrupt. I would have had that residual income when I couldn't work. Um, and the same thing with multifamily. I waited way too long to get into multifamily because it really is a very good asset class to be in. But anyway, so with that premise, the uh, preface, the uh, biggest mistake I ever made in my estimation was uh, walking away from from deals that I should have bought, um, which I realize is probably a little bit different than um, than uh, what you usually hear on your show. So um, there was this one deal that just bugs me every time I think about it. Um, we started out, like I said, with a 12 unit, and then we bought a 19 unit, then we bought a 32 unit, and we're you know just trying to up our game a little bit every time. So we were looking at this uh, 40 unit, and this is about two years ago now. Um, and it was, it was actually, it might've been a 48 unit. Um, and it was a really nice looking property. It was four different buildings, um, 12 units in each building, all, all in a little, had a little courtyard in the center. And we had some drone footage. I mean, it was really cool. And I mean, I was really excited about this deal. Um, but it was a, um, uh, a HUD subsidized property, right? So it had, uh, it had a um, contract on it for 20 of the 48 units, uh, where they had a wait list all the time because the, the, if you got on that on that on those 20 units, so you didn't pay any rent, right? You had to qualify. You had to, you know, it was income-based qualification. But the, the stuff that we had to do to transfer this contract was really complicated, right? And we um, were looking at this deal and we're like, man, it's a couple million dollars and it was bigger than any deal we'd ever done. And we started finding out about how hard it was to transfer this contract and we got overwhelmed, right? And so to me, that was probably the the biggest misstep we ever made is like one, we tried to bite off something we didn't fully understand. And then rather than drill down and figure it out, we, uh, we just let it get overwhelming. So. Jeffrey, I think this one is perfect, right? Uh, There's so many deals that don't make it to a podcast because they didn't get done. Right. Um, And I think, you know, there's four things that every investor is trying to overcome knowledge, deal flow, experience, and capital. And it ebbs and flows depending on where they are in the process. But that knowledge piece, that's a very specific asset class, right? Um, And if you aren't familiar with the reporting and all of the other stuff that goes into it, you can get wrapped around the axle pretty quick and get in trouble, right? Because if you're not, you get in real trouble. Yeah, you definitely can. And in this case, like, you know, what I know about it now is that, like, we could have literally hired someone to help us with it, right? Like, we we were, oh, we have to learn this all. We're both attorneys, like, we can figure it out. And we're tr- drilling through these contracts and all these rules and regulations and having conference calls with the agency. And um, it just seems so overwhelming. And reality is there are people that do this stuff all the time that, that consult on it. And if we just spent a couple thousand dollars, we would have got the deal done. Like, I know that now. And the deal is amazing. Like, it's probably, you know, would be worth a million dollars more than we paid now a couple of years later. Um, and so, you know, you would have put four or $500,000 down and, and, you know, tripled up your money in two years. And it was all because we didn't want to spend a couple thousand dollars to have someone tell us how to do it. Um, which the knowledge piece is really important. But part of knowledge is understanding what you should be doing yourself and what other people should be doing for you. Yeah, I mean, that, that self-awareness is core, right? Um, now, what's interesting, so you, you admitted that you have a partner and it's another attorney. Uh, have you guys done other deals together or was that the only deal you looked at together? Uh, yeah, no. Um, actually, when I first uh, filed bankruptcy, um, he was already, I met him in law school and he was um, flipping houses in uh, Metro Detroit. And uh, the market was crazy, right? It was 2010 and 
And uh, he called me up one day and he said, you know, I found this condo that's super great deal. And uh, it used to be a hundred thousand and we can get it from the bank for 30. And it was in a really good area. And I said, man, that sounds great. And I had saved up, like I'd been working for six months after my bankruptcy and I'd saved up like, I don't know, $18,000. And I needed to put $15,000 in to buy this condo. And I told my wife, I want to do this. And she was like, that's crazy. That's all of our money. Like we can't do it. Like we don't want to go bankrupt. I'm like, we can't go bankrupt. We're paying cash, right? Like it's impossible to bankrupt yourself when you pay cash. And uh, it, it really came down to like, like uh, my partner, Travis had been so good to me when I got sick, uh, came and worked for me for free for a while and stuff just to make sure I didn't lose my law license, you know, cause you can't just drop people mid case. It's a big problem. Uh, and so he did a lot of favors for me. And my wife was like, well, if it was anyone but Travis, we wouldn't be doing this. But I, I trust that Travis will take care of us. So so after that, I did a lot of deals with him, actually. And uh, and still, I would say about 80% of what I own, I'm partnered with him in some form or the other. Um, some of the deals, you know, we are 50-50. Some of them we have a third partner in. Uh, some of them I have a little piece of and he has a bigger piece of. It just depended on when we set the deal up. Um, how much each of us got and stuff like that. But we, we definitely have stuff in, in uh, Tennessee, uh, in uh, Georgia, in um, Michigan, and also in Kentucky that we own together. So it's uh, spread out a little bit. But What's up, guys? It's your host, Jerome. I just want to let you know we launched Myers Methods in the fall of 2019 with the ambition to inspire a new breed of multifamily investors. If you are interested in getting into multifamily or scaling your current business, hop over to our website at MyersMethods.com to grab your free four-step guide on how to get the ball rolling in multifamily. Now, let's get back to the episode. So that's really cool. And so one of the things that most people stumble on is partnering. Right. And so now we've got two attorneys in the same deal. Usually, you know, you got one arguing for one side and one arguing for the other. How does that work? And what are what are some best practices from your perspective on partnering? Well, I mean, the trick with any partnership, whether you're with an attorney or not, is to make sure you have a good understanding of what your roles are and you have it in writing. Right. So for me, um, you know, if you're not an attorney and maybe even if you are, you should probably hire an attorney to draft your documents, make sure everything's clear, um, you know, decide what type of entity you're going to have, whether it's an LLC or whatever. And then and then get someone to draft that. Make sure there's a solid operating agreement that says who's doing what. And then, you know, communicate like crazy. Right. So Travis and I still talk about our deals probably five or six times a week, every week. And we have for like, you know, 10 years now, right? We just talk about it because, well, we keep buying stuff. And so there's new deals to think about and all the stuff we have, like, you know, things will come up. Some There's a problem. It needs a new boiler at a building or something. And we need to know that stuff. But also, um, you know, the stuff that's in Michigan, Travis lives in Michigan and he runs a property management company up there. I have to trust that he's doing his job and I do trust him. And that helps a lot too. So communication and trust, uh, those are the two, to me, the most important things. And the way you do that is writing uh, and then talking and then, and then verifying for a while until you build that trust, right? Don't jump into a partnership with someone that you met like 15 minutes ago. Like, you know, I'm sure you're a great guy, Jerome, but like, if you want to partner with me, we need to get to know each other a little bit first, right? Like we can't, I mean, we met on LinkedIn last week or something. So you don't um, uh, marry me after a one night stand is what you're saying. Exactly. That's exactly right. And I mean, there's always a temptation for that. Cause I get people all the time. They'll call me up and tell me about some great deal that they run into and it sounds good. And I'm thinking, Oh man, I should get into this deal. Um, and you know, it's okay if you can, you know, if, if you, if you spend the time, the due diligence about studying the deal, but also studying the partnership. Right. I mean, you really, that's, it's just another part of your due diligence if you're going to partner. And I'm an enormous fan of partners so much so that um, I think right now, every single piece of real estate that I own, other than my personal house, I have a partner on. Well, you're married. You got a partner on that too. That's, that's right. I do. I mean, my wife would definitely object to me saying I don't have a partner there too. So. So I, I guess one of the, you know, last questions I would ask. So when you, you didn't buy the deal, right? Uh, you feel like you could have gotten the education you needed for a few thousand dollars. Uh, why would you go that route to, I guess, get somebody to come in and consult instead of bringing them in as a long range partner? 
Yeah, I mean, so it's just deal specific. In that particular case, we knew how to operate the deal, right? It was in our wheelhouse. We knew where things were. Um, we knew what the agencies would need. And it was really just about learning this one little piece. And it would be a lot cheaper to pay someone to help us with that one little piece than it would be to give them a chunk of a deal that we expected to make a lot of money on. Um, you know, and part of it was fear too for us at that point, right? I mean, it wasn't just we didn't know how to do this. We were um, expanding quickly. We had gone from no multifamilies other than like duplexes and stuff to having, um, you know, having bought like, you know, 60 units of apartments and now we're going to buy 50 more in one, one deal, right? So we're going to almost double up our apartments on that one deal. Um, and, you know, we've done that since and it's been fine, uh, but we needed to take a breather too. That's, you know, that was part of it. But, but uh, yeah, I mean, going back, uh, if I'd taken a partner that had that knowledge, that would have been good too. I mean, that would have worked, but it, knowing what I know now, I'd rather keep as much of that deal as possible. Right. So that's the other thing with taking partners, like they have to bring value to you that you can't get elsewhere. Um, because there is something to be said, even though I love partnerships that it would be kind of cool not to have partners. Right. Like on some of my stuff, like if I didn't have partners, I might, I might decide to sell at a different time and take the money and, you know, go on vacation or something. Um, the partners prevent me from doing that kind of stuff, which is actually good in a way, right. It forces you to, um, you know, have a, a thought out plan of action instead of being reactionary. Yeah, I think that's, that's awesome. So you, you do JVs or joint ventures. You guys don't do syndication. Is that correct? Uh, well, we started doing syndication last year. Um, we did a couple of commercial buildings, non-residential commercial buildings. And then um, this year we bought a, a small apartment complex in a syndication Um and what we did with that is it's, it's actually a, it's a condo conversion. It's just 22 units that we're going to convert into uh, condominiums and resell. And is everything that you guys have been doing in cash? It's really interesting to see your growth and to see like without the experienced partner getting you into the space. So how did you guys, you know, bridge that gap? Uh, yeah. So, um, you know, when you started with smaller, you know, 12 or, you know, 20 units, stuff like that, um, and you have a bunch of residential property already, the banks are a little bit more flexible on that. I mean, you need to have a key principle if you want to go get a non-recourse loan. Um, but the way you qualify as a key principle is you show that you have operational knowledge in that marketplace. And so what we did is we bought a 12 or 19 unit that wasn't non-recourse, you know, it was just traditional banks. And we went to the banks and credit unions we were already using said, hey, I've got, you know, 50 houses in this neighborhood and um, I want to buy a 12 unit building. And they're like, okay, whatever, just put 20% down and call it good, right? So we were able to make that change pretty easily. And then when we moved into non-recourse stuff, um, it was a function of we were already buying, you know, 20 unit buildings and then we we're moving to a 30 unit building. Right. And so we could show that we had that operational knowledge. There were some steps we had to go through, but the um, lenders worked us through it and we just, you know, you have liquidity requirements and um, you know, obviously operating reserve requirements and things. And they're straight, they're maybe more stringent on you if you have less experience, but that's okay. Right. I mean, and we would have brought in, and that's another example where like, if I could do it over again, I might've went right to 50 or hundred unit building right out of the bat uh, and brought in someone that had that key principal status already because um, you can you can gain it by partnering with people for a while and then you can go through the hoops later right mm -hmm. uh, but yeah it wasn't that difficult it's just um it's just persistence moving forward and talking to the bankers and understanding what they need on the non-recourse loans what i've seen most frequently is they're looking for additional forms of repayment so is you or your partner, do you guys have income streams outside of real estate? Um, you know, uh, some, but not very many. It's mostly real estate based. The non-recourse stuff, um, they're going to do a net worth requirement. So you're going to want to see that you have a net worth that's equal to the loan amount or greater. Um, they're going to have um, some kind of liquidity requirement, which right now, while we're dealing with the coronavirus thing, has gone way up. It used to be, um, you know, six months worth of payments was enough. Now they're you know, they're actually escrowing 12 months worth of payments. Like you're having to put that money aside in a bank that you can't touch just to be safe, right? Um, which can be a lot of money, right? If your payment's 15000 or $20,000 a month and you have to make uh, 12 payments in the, I mean, you can put a quarter of a million dollars away easy. And if you have some of these bigger projects, you know, the payments are hundreds of thousands a month. So you could be looking at sitting on a couple million in cash 
uh, that you can't even do anything with. So, so you definitely have that that they're looking at. And that's where they care more than like your own personal other income. They look at your other income to make sure that you're not going to be trying to take money from that deal. Right. So if you bought an apartment complex that maybe it made ten thousand dollars a month, they don't want you to live on that ten thousand a month. Right. They want you to be able to support yourself without that particular deal. And so if you have other real estate income, that's usually sufficient um, as long as you've had it for a while. I mean, if you bought a building yesterday and then you want to claim that as your income, they might be a little suspicious of that. But No seasoning. No seasoning. So did you guys make a process change so that you don't miss out on deals you feel like you should buy? anymore? Um, no, you know, because the way we do stuff, cause it's, you know, when we're not syndicating stuff and it's just us, we're just looking at each deal individually and then making a determination between the two of us or three of us, um, about if we want it or not. And so what we've done differently is we've talked about what we did wrong in the past and we've looked at it. And so now if that same situation comes up, we wouldn't have that same problem, you know, and it's, it's a mindset thing where we're just constantly trying to learn. If we don't, if we do something that we did made a mistake on, maybe we overpaid for something, then we have to look at that and say, okay, well, why did we think it was worth that? And what could we have done differently? So like on that first deal I bought that I think I overpaid on, um, I realized that I trusted the seller's numbers way too much, right? And I don't recommend that. Like you need to have your own numbers. And the more stuff you have in the market, the better you're going to understand the numbers. So you're just going to be constantly getting better and growing. Beautiful, beautiful. And the last question is, you know, what words of wisdom do you have for our listeners? Uh, stay positive. I mean, right now it's a challenging time. And I mean, I know that, that, you know, I mean, we're recording this in April, so it's obviously, you know, it might be different in June or whenever this comes out, but, uh, you know, stay positive. Like no matter what happens in the world, you can get through it by just moving forward one step at a time. And that's true in real estate too. You're going to have things that are tricky and challenging. Um, but if you keep pressing forward, you're going to come out. Okay. I mean, real estate, um, is very forgiving if you hold stuff for the long term. So if your plan is long term, then you'll be all right. Awesome. Awesome. Jeffrey, thank you for coming in and sharing with the listeners. I really appreciate it. And yeah, no problem. Thanks for having me. We'll talk to you soon. Maybe we can get married after a second or third date. <laughs> yeah, you never know. I mean, I'm going to be honest. You have to talk to my wife and see if she's okay with it first, but uh, we'll see what happens. All right, man. We'll talk soon. <laughs> Thanks, Jerome. You made it to this juncture, so you really love what we shared on this episode of Myers Methods Presents Multifamily Missteps. Do us a favor, give us a five-star rating, give us a review, and share this with somebody who's interested in multifamily investing. Until the next time, the pack is with you.